Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 0 0.90 Beta. In the previous episode I managed to get into orbit around Duna and Ike with some difficulty thanks to the fact that I didn't have patch conics or maneuver nodes unlocked but I got there eventually. <laughs> I got there eventually. Um, but this time I want to land on Ike and then land on Duna thus fulfilling these contracts as well. Uh, so I just need one more thing on here and that's an antenna. Gotta forget. Uh, gotta re remember the antenna. Otherwise, we can't transmit that data. We've got a thermometer on. We've got two goo containers. And I've got the solar panels angled. I, I that that actually probably won't help uh, the solar input, but it will help make this look a little bit better than it normally does. So I'm going with that. Oh, 31 parts. Um, what can we dump? Hmm. Could go with three lander legs. I don't like three lander legs though, honestly. But maybe that's the way to go. Alright, so three lander legs instead. Hopefully we'll make a good landing with that. And hopefully with patch conics I'll have enough fuel left over to do so. That's going to be the trick. Uh, it's not... It, it, Ike is uh, not as bad as the moon. Uh, not that the moon is horrible, but I'm just saying. Uh, but it's still it's still a fair-sized moon. As I discussed in the previous episode, though, we do have to wait until we have a transfer to Duna available to us, and so I'm going to do that now. Get within 45 degrees. You can see the new orbit of our previous Duna probe there. It is now going to be circling the sun in that orbit as it was spit out of Duna. Okay, so the phase angle we're looking for is 45 degrees, 44.36 actually, but uh, about 45 degrees. I think that's 45. Okay, not the best time for a launch, but uh, we can go for it. Uh, this is our first time carrying a thermometer, so let's log temperature and if it'll let us transmit. Make sure that we don't have too much electric charge expenditure. Looks all good. Alright, so we can probably do one more on the way up. But without further ado, let us launch. Hey, hello. Uh, I just pressed spacebar and nothing happened. Launch. Hmm. My pressing spacebar didn't work. Hold on. Okay, you silly thing. I don't have remote tech installed, so when I say launch, you should launch, right? That's the engine. Those are the clamps. Ha! Huh. My launch pad is able to do more than 18 tons. This is a larger than 18 ton craft, by the way. Let's go to the VAB. Uh, hold on. Let's let's recover vessel. Okay, so we re recovered vessel. Some people have mentioned that this is a bug. So maybe I, this is my opportunity to ex examine this situation. Uh, tell you what, let us start by seeing if a less than 18 ton launch will work. It'll put us a little bit under under weight in terms of delta V, but maybe that's the way to go. Let's try this. Okay, here we are again. Let's say us on, throw up, and nope, doesn't work. Ooh, so a bug it is. Let me try restarting the program. My initial hypothesis at this point is that the bug has something to do with unlocking patch conics because that's the only thing that changed. I mean, I unlocked some technologies, but basically patch conics was the main thing that changed uh, between our launches previously and this launch 
most recently. So I think that's going to be my hypothesis. Let's find out. Okay, well, here's Eichlander 1 again. Uh, the less than 18 ton version. SAS on, throw up, and now it launches. So a restart seemed to fix it this time, but I can't guarantee in future times. And now we have less Delta V than I normally would carry. I wonder if the greater than 18 ton one would have worked. But uh, we've launched this one now, so let's carry on with it. We should be able to get a flying over... Well, we did unlock the thermometers, but I think the patch conics is a bigger thing. Uh, does the antenna snap off in the atmosphere in this, or is that just remote tech that does that? I think it might be remote tech that does that, but... Yeah, let's transmit. Let's see. Yeah, okay. It is remote tech that uh, has it snapping off like that. Or maybe far. Maybe it's fair mirror space. Oh, did I put two antennas accidentally? I think I did symmetry. I put two antennas. That's that's why I had to put only three lander legs. I should have been able to put an antenna without reducing the lander legs. Anyway, that saves us mass, so it's fine. Okay, separate and ignition. Oh, now we've got time to apoapsis too. So with patch conics we get that, huh? Okay, well that's good. Important information and all. Probably need to tilt up given the way that's going down. Again, this is an underpowered stage. We are above a thrust to weight ratio of one, but just barely. So we've talked about uh, calculating burn time, but that's for the full fuel burn of the stage. Uh, it's also possible to calculate the exact amount of time it takes to burn a certain amount of delta V using the same equations, uh, just working backwards from the rocket equation. And in that case, if you know what delta V you need to get into orbit, like say we need about 500 meters per second, it is possible to calculate how many seconds it's going to take and therefore end your burn right at apoapsis and make sure that you're not uh, overshooting. But I'm not doing that right now. That's the end of that stage. In any case, we'd have to calculate for two stages since we've got one stage being exhausted here. We're low on this side, I know. I'm going to have to boost up on the opposite side. So yeah, I didn't make it uh, quite clear last time, but uh, by combining escape velocity and your burn towards your interplanetary target, uh, which uh, could be two burns, could be one burn, but if you combine the burns, uh, it ends up being that the delta V cost is actually the square root of the two delta v's uh, added squared. So it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's like the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, so because they're both vectors and they're orthogonal vectors and we could go on about that, but basically they're two legs of a triangle and by doing it all in one burn you're calculating the hypotenuse. So it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared and so c squared is the actual delta v you have to burn if you do both a and b at the same time. If you do A and B separately, you're going to have to do A plus B, which is more than C. Okay, let's boost our orbit to a nice, nice circular one, or close to circular. That's pretty close. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay, so here's a little probe. Just for power's sake while we're figuring things out. Let me orient it north-south again. Okay, uh, so we've got our orbit looking... okay, so we have to turn around like this. And so we want to head out this way. And once again I'm going to burn over here, so we're pretty close to our burn point. Oh, wait, uh, we, we have maneuver nodes. Oh, 
So patch conix adds maneuver nodes. Okay. Well, that makes things a lot easier. So you see here, I'm getting the yellow dotted line to line up with the purple dotted line, which is in line with Kerbin's own orbit. Uh, can I select target? Yes, I can. Well, patch conic gives us everything. How nice. Well, it's definitely worth the cash then. Okay. So then we have a close approach there, but you can see our yellow dotted line is a little bit off from the purple dotted line. So that means that's not ideal, and we're gonna pass this point. Darn it. So I'm gonna give it another. Another go around. But I think we gotta pass it again. Uh, Okay, and so your main adjustment is where in your orbit you're going to. So it looks like we, we're going to end up hitting whoop, hitting Tuna over here somewhere. Not the perfect Coleman transfer, but that's probably because we're not at a 45 degree angle. I think I'll take this. So we've passed it again, but I'll just go for another orbit around. Okay, so 1078 meters per second it looks like. Again, not far off from what we figured out last time. Uh, we could probably fine tune it here to get a little bit closer. So it's 20,000 kilometers. Okay, so that's as much as that can do for us. The ascending node is here, so we have to do an inclination correction here to get any closer. Uh, we could try radial burns to get closer, but they're not very efficient. And you can see they, do, they don't do very much here, just a little bit here and there. If you really did a lot more, you could probably get some effect out of it, but not much. So the key is, if you're going to the outer planets, make sure your trajectory is going out this way. And of course, for the outer planets, you're going to have it, uh, for the inner planets, you're going to have it going this way. Okay, looks like we have to wait for 30 minutes. But in general, if you remember that uh, your transfer should probably be around the 5 o'clock mark here. That's not going to be too far off, even if you don't have the maneuver nodes. That for Duna. Some of the other planets might be a little bit different than that. Maneuver node! Our first maneuver node ever in this series. Amazing. Appropriate that it should be for a Duna transfer. So again, if th this was a uh, good home and transfer, we'd meet it up here. But I'll take this. This is fine. Uh, yeah, let's go. Looks like good timing. You could probably do an orbital thermometer thing. Yeah. Could have probably picked up a contract for that too. Missed out on that. Now, there is one trick. If you're close to the planet like this, then you have to do your burn pretty quickly. Because otherwise, you can see the blue path is deviating from the yellow dotted line. If it takes you a long time to do this burn, you're going to end up having this huge gap between what you were supposed to be doing and what you really are doing. And so, if you think you're going to take a long time to do the burn, you'll need to get into a higher orbit. Okay, at this point I would like to see exactly what's going on with our orbit and our target. And in fact I'll get rid of the maneuver node. So we just gotta see what's going on here. Okay, there we have our Duna periapsis, and okay, that's as close as it gets. I'm gonna do a burn on this side. There. That is fine. On Orient South, it's for the solar panels, but we're on the dark side right now. Now, uh, since we have all the maneuver node stuff, I can actually plot my mid-course plane change here, which is correcting this little 0.1 degree difference that we have with Duna. And so there's the ascending node, 
So I want to pull down, I want to descend if it's the ascending node, and now I have it being not a number, nan, which is basically zero. So now I've corrected the inclination, which means that I can get closer to Duna. And we can see uh, Duna is going to perturb my orbit. And in fact, right now, the Duna periapsis is 180 kilometers, which is quite close enough. So that's all I need to do. Uh, so doing a mid-course plane change, very important. Uh, just for 7.5 meters per second worth of delta V, we end up with uh, going from a 19,000 kilometer orbit around Duna to a 180 kilometer orbit. So big difference, very beneficial. If you try and do it closer to Duna, uh, it'll cost you a lot more. So, mid-course plane change, uh, even if you don't have the, uh, you should do it at the ascending or descending node, but uh, you can correct inclination. If the ascending or descending node is at Kerbin, for instance, it doesn't have to be in the middle there, it could be at Kerbin. You can still do a mid-course adjustment to adjust your orbit, and that might help too. But it's generally, generally more helpful if you've got an inclination change to do. Okay, I think we'll be leaving Kerbin now. There we go. So now we have a Kerbin escape marker here. And that tells us that we are going to escape in 17 hours. When crossing the boundaries between spheres of influence, and that's the boundary right there. That's the limit of Kerbin's sphere of influence over us. And so we need to make sure not to time warp too quickly across that because the system is going to try and calculate some numbers for us and it might mess up if we're going too fast with physical uh, with a uh, time warp, not physical time warp. If it was physical time warp, it'd be able to manage it. But it's because it's not physical time warp that it's going to perhaps make an error. Now we're in interplanetary space. And we proceed. Oh, we can do a thermometer reading here. Oh, no, we can't. I take it back. Should be able to, but for some reason they don't think it's important. Silly Kerbals. So the green dotted line is our resulting orbit after hitting Duna. Duna is going to change our orbit because of its own gravitational influence and turn it into that green dotted line. And uh, when you get down to doing gravity assists, that's going to be what you're going to want to look at, is how the planets change your resulting orbit. So if we wanted to use Duna to boost to a higher orbit to get to Joule, for instance, we would want that going the other way. Right now it's pulling us in. OK, this is close enough. The mid-course plane change doesn't have to be as exact as some of your other burns. Okay, uh, this is a good example. So we can see Aduna is now lifting our orbit up. And in fact, it's worthwhile to pay attention to what's going on here. So I'm actually going to kind of do some test burns in various directions to see how close Duna I can get. Oop, that was quick. All right, that's close enough. Okay. So now we're headed in, and there is an Ike encounter on the way. However, it all depends on whether we hit Duna first or Ike first. We really need to, uh, we really need Duna's help to slow down. So probably the Ike encounter we won't take. Uh, let's make sure we're pointing north south to help our solar panels. That's only because of the way my solar panels are placed. By the way, that north south works. If your solar panels are placed differently, it might not be good to orient north south necessarily. Okay, here we go, entering the sphere of influence. Slow down a little bit. Uh, okay. So, here's our entry to, to the Duna system. Got an Ike periapsis, Duna periapsis, everything. Um, I want to correct inclination first. Ooh, that was a weird bug. And that's so I can make it easier to hit Ike afterwards, because I don't think I'm going to be hitting Ike immediately. 
Yeah. I'm gonna wanna arrow break around Duna first. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get close to Duna so that slows me down and brings me into an orbit instead of having to make a burn to get into orbit myself. And remember, it's a lot more than it was in the previous episode to get into orbit. In the previous episode, it was easy to get into orbit around Duna by burning on my own because I had already done so many burns to match with Duna, Duna's orbit ahead of time. This time, we are quite different from Duna's orbit. And so it would take quite a lot to match orbits. So I'm going to get Duna to use its atmosphere to correct that for me. For now, I'm going to aim for this kind of burn. But the altitude I want is 12 kilometers or thereabouts. I can use air braking calculator to figure out exactly what altitude I want. Again, website uh, you should have handy for these sorts of things and so I'm gonna do this burn now. For these burns the earlier the better. I don't want to know my Ike periapsis, I want to know my Duna periapsis. Okay, it should be around 12 kilometers, but let me check air braking calculators so that we don't make any mistakes here. Okay, so uh, uh, we need our orbit speed, 10, 19.7, and our current altitude, 47,160 kilometers is close enough. All right. Okay, I set my desired apoapsis to be Ike's altitude, so I want to have an orbit that will touch Ike's orbit. And I get that I actually should be in 13 at 13 kilometers or close to it. So let me head for that marker. Where are you? Uh, actually, it's one of the radial markers that I should be going for. Let's see if this is the right one. Ooh, too much. That's too little, but I don't think I can do a finer adjustment until I get closer. So let's time warp in. Now we've got another Duna contract. We can do a little bit of scientific data from Duna. And in fact, while we're far out here, let's do a thermometer reading. If, no, I don't think we could. Thermometer readings can't be done from this far out. I remember. I'm not very good at remembering when I can do the scientific experiments, honestly. Not data I store at all. Let me try this direction. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's fine. Okay. There's Duna. So let's get close to Duna. And we are orienting retrograde, as is traditional. Let's see if a thermometer reading is doable here. No. Bit of a shame. Uh, sometimes uh, thermometer readings just don't work out. But mystery goo. Transmit. Yep. Okay. Did that fulfill that contract? Yes, it did. Good. So now on to our Ike landing after we aero break. So our orbital speed is still increasing as we get close to Duna. At some point it starts decreasing because of the atmosphere. And we just hope we don't hit any mountains along the way. Should be close to our periapsis right now. How's it doing? 11 more seconds. Gonna set Ike as a target. Okay, we have passed periapsis. It's still slowing us down. Still not in orbit around Duna. 
can sort of see how much it takes to get into orbit. And actually if we zoom out, you can see what's happening to our orbit on a macro level. What Duna is actually doing is it's uh, boosting our orbit to its own orbit. Which is what we did manually last time. So air braking is a nifty thing. Saves you a lot of work. There we go. Looks like we're coming close to matching Duna's orbit. And when we do, we get orbit. And if air braking calculator was correct, then my apoapsis should be very close to Ike's orbit, which would be ideal. So we're around here. Heading back up. Don't suppose the thermometer will be... Yep, okay, we can try a thermometer reading. Yes, good. So you'll notice I, I, I'm not carrying the Science Junior this time. And that's to keep the Delta V high so that I can make the landing. We, we're probably overdoing it, but still. Uh, we are under 18 tons on this launch, so probably better I did that. So I'm bringing the orbit in myself, not too much work, and you can sort of see Ike's huge sphere of influence doing its, its thing. And I am getting close to Ike. There we go. So, patch conics, wonderful stuff. 46 kilometers is quite good enough. So here, this is a gravity assist from Ike, obviously. We were in orbit around Duna. I wouldn't call it assist so much, but because uh, it's not what we want to do. But uh, Ike is shooting us out into interplanetary space, so it's giving us a uh, velocity boost. And in fact, if we take a look, uh, it doesn't show us what our resulting orbit is. You can increase patch conics uh, how many iterations, how many steps it does. So right now it's doing three steps. It's doing uh, a current orbit uh, Ike uh, encounter and then this purple route. But in the settings file you can increase what it does. So you can even uh, get it to show what happens after this purple exit route away from Duna's sphere of influence. So that's something if you uh, trying something very complicated with the planets, so you might want to go in the settings file and up how many uh, conic, patch conic, what, what's the thing? I forget what the variable name is, but you can increase that. Not the mode. The mode just shows that, that, that determines how it's displayed and you want to keep that the same. Unless you're doing something very specific and you know what you're doing. Okay, so we can add a maneuver now to get into orbit. Of course, all we have to do is do a retro burn at periapsis, but it's interesting to find out how much delta V it takes to get into orbit. So now we find out uh, tight orbit can be achieved with 151 meters per second. So this is information we can use for planning in the future when we are dealing with our delta V budget. If we want to land something on Ike in the future, we now know that 151 meters per second should be just fine for getting into orbit around Ike and we can use that to plan how much delta V we put on our craft. That's something you could calculate by hand, but uh, I think uh, we've had enough of that. So here again, the, the net effect is that uh, we're trying to figure out, uh, we were in a very tight orbit around Duna like this and this 151 is boosting our orbit up to the whole thing though there's also the complication of Ike's own gravity boosting us so that uh, changes things as well okay here we go for orbit a little bit early and that camera swing shows that we are well it's not quite curved around there we go Okay, that's orbit around Ike. I think uh, I'll try and land on this spot, shall I? 
I think that's a nice bright spot to touch down upon. So, landings. Uh, we haven't done too much talk about landings. I'm going to bring my orbit further down. Just so that the periapsis is right above the surface. But this is not where my landing spot is going to be, obviously. We're trying to land here. But we're going to bring it very low so that on our entire orbit we're skimming. In fact, that part we were actually crashing into the surface. But we're going to be coming in fairly low and smoothly. Going to bring the landing gear down, the three legs. Again, I think it's the first time I'm ever using three legs instead of four. And the ideal situation is you you have figured out how much time it's going to take you to burn and how long it's going to take you to impact on the ground and you're going to finish your burn right before you impact kind of thing. But we're not going to do that because I, uh, I hate that kind of burn personally. Uh, Alright, so we've transmitted some thermometer data. We'll save the goo container for the surface. Okay, so we're trying to land here. Probably best to start the burn now. Okay. Let's change camera view. Somewhere around here will be fine. Okay. We are way ahead of time. Unfortunately, it doesn't give you a time to impact, though we we'll talk about three minutes at most. But I don't think it's going to take more than a minute to burn all the, all the fuel in this thing, actually. Okay, well, anywhere here is fine. I don't know how high the terrain is, so that's another thing to worry about. Just keeping a trivial amount of thrust going here. So there's got to be biomes at uh, Ike right now, right? It, the contract didn't specify that we should land at a particular biome. But... Will we find out some interesting biome information this time. Okay, I see our shadow. So, when you're uh, landing, don't follow that retrograde vector too closely, but sort of tilt a little bit in its direction if it's not perfectly vertical. So here it's a little bit closer to 45 degrees, so I tilt a little bit towards it. Okay, no, 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 don't start going up. Unfortunately, only a little bit of thrust is necessary for me to start going up right now. Ah, stop it. Get down. Okay. We are on the ground at Ike. Everything confirmed that? Yes, we've landed at Ike. Let's do the good container first. Okay, transmit that data. Yep. Oh, I forgot to check what biome it was. And now I can't access it. Okay, let's do the thermometer reading and see if that... Okay, Ike's central mountain range. Okay, no little uh, flavor text for that. But okay, so we've got a biome. Central Mountain Range is apparently this biome. Okay, let's transmit this data. Alright, so we fulfilled the Ike contract. How much delta V do we have left? Uh, well, let's bring out the calculator. So uh, we've got uh, 44.25 divided by, divided by, there, divided by 90. That's tons of fuel. We've got 1,428 meters per second of the delta V left. That's quite a lot. And it's certainly enough to make me think that we could land on Dunovai problems by adding a parachute on this. 
or maybe even just going directly without the parachute and just doing a full retro burn to slow down at Duna and making a landing. Okay, so that is something I am going to tackle next. Uh, I think though landing on Ike is a sufficient thing for this episode, so let's go back to the Space Center. We are now back to having 404,000 funds and we've got 268.5 science. Um, well, it's not like we can do anything else with the science right now except for unlock these four that we've got here. So we might as well go ahead with that. Um, yeah, sure, why not? And that's that's that. So we'll have to collect more science. I'm sure we'll be doing that momentarily. But yeah, so uh, with that, uh, I'll probably be uh, posting the next video where we make the Duna attempt pretty quickly. And so you got to watch that. So next stop, landing on Duna. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments, suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.